Jerry held out a bottled water and I took him down the whole thing in one pull, then forced myself up from the hammock. I need to get out of here. There was an accident. People are dead. <laughs> cool, he said. But you probably shouldn't go anywhere until O'Brien shows up. I ignored him. I left the closet on my own two feet. The pain in my leg was... It was bad, but bearable. I'd rather power through than borrow someone's spare crutches. When I stepped into the store, the combination of natural and fluorescent lights stung my eyes and gave me the realization that I had absolutely no idea what time it was. Is that him? I looked at where the voice was coming from to see a woman in a deputy uniform staring right at me. She was tall and attractive, dark skin with hair pulled back into a ponytail and a look on her face that said, don't even think about fucking with me. She had been leaning against the counter next to the cashier, the one with all the books. He looked over at me and whispered something to her that I couldn't make out, which caused her to stand up straight and put her right thumb in her belt next to her gun holster. I've seen that tick before. She was trigger happy and ready to put me down if she needed to. Mr. Riggins, she asked. I stood perfectly still and put my hands in front of me in the least intimidating way I could, remembering that I still had fresh red nail polish on my fingernails. Officer, I said. She took a second, probably trying to figure out what kind of lunatic she was dealing with. In an effort to get in front of the whole thing, I tried to explain the situation. There's been an accident. I wanted to give a statement, but I've been attacked and I require medical assistance. She cocked her head slightly to one side and said, You look fine to me. Yeah, bullshit, I do. I was in the truck when it flipped. What truck? Are you fucking with me right now? Shit, too much. Now her fingers were on the gun, ready to pull. I needed to reel it in a little. After a long, deliberate, loud breath, I said, Sorry, officer, I'm a little shaken up because I was in an accident. The vehicle I was in went off the road. And it flipped. You were in an accident. Yes. Was anybody hurt? Was anybody hurt? That was, that was unexpected. How long had I been unconscious? There was no possible way they hadn't found the wreck and the, and the bodies by now. Which meant she was either screwing with me or testing me. Now, if it was the latter, then why? Was she trying to trip me up? Get me to contradict my own story? That's when it hit me. This was an interrogation. There were bodies. Victims, now. And someone was going to hang for it. I had to choose my next words very carefully. Yeah. Yeah, three people died in the wreck. I came straight here to call the police, but the blood loss knocked me out before I could. I... I could take you right to where it all happened. She took a step towards me. Just one. Putting herself between me and the cashier. And that's interesting, I thought. If I hadn't been paying attention, I might have missed it, but her body language was telegraphing a clear message. That was an unknown. A potential threat. And her priority in this situation was protecting the guy behind the counter. What was even more interesting was that what she didn't do. All right, Mr. Riggins. We'll take my car and you can show me exactly where this all went down. Sound good? It was only then that I noticed her soft Brooklyn accent. Now, one thing was for sure. She, she wasn't local. I'd have to look her up once I got back to my phone or someplace with the internet. Yeah, yeah. That sounds okay. She gestured towards the door and let me lead the way, her hand never leaving the gun until we were both outside. She didn't call it in. Now, I had just informed her that there were dead bodies. She didn't radio dispatch, backup, EMTs, anybody. There was one obvious reason why that would be the case. She must have already known about the wreck. I saw our cruiser in the spot furthest from the doors, parked backwards in the spot for a fast getaway. I stepped around the passenger side and looked back at her, half expecting to see her pull the gun and take me down right there. But now that we were outside, she seemed instantly calmer. Well? She asked. What are you waiting for? The door's unlocked. She opened the driver's side and took her spot behind the wheel. She isn't going to make me ride in the back seat? That's good, I think. I took my spot in the passenger side and instantly put on my seatbelt. But before I could even click it into place, O'Brien had the car pulled onto the road. 
Which way? I pointed back in the direction I'd come, downhill, away from the town. She peeled out and gunned the vehicle. I watched the side of the road for any sign of the bear or the little girl, but at the speed she was driving, I doubt that I'd been able to pick out anything that wasn't right next to the street. We passed the dirt road and led to the family's hunting ground. I made a mental note to come back later and find out where Ned had left my wallet and keys. Should be right up here, around the bend. I replayed the event in my mind. Straight for a mile, I see a dirt road on the left, Paul punching me in the gut. Their perverse laugh. The arrow, stab, screams, the bear. All right, slow down. You should be right. O'Brien slowed the car and hit the red and blues. We were right on top of where the truck had gone off the road. And there was... Nothing. Where? She asked. Stop the car. I hopped out before she had even come to a complete stop on the shoulder of the road. I ignored the stinging in my leg as best I could. This... This wasn't possible. I couldn't have been unconscious that long. They... They had already moved the truck. I ran into the grass and stood in the exact spot where I had been pulled from the mangled wreck earlier that day, but there was nothing there, no sign of any wreckage, no blood, no debris, no ruts in the dirt, not a single blade of grass out of place. O'Brien yelled out to me from her spot next to the cruiser. Now, I don't think it's out here. Maybe we should head up the road a ways. It all looks the same to me. No, no, I'm, I'm certain it was right here. Well, it's not right here anymore. So how about we get you back into town and you can give a statement? I took a deep breath, caught an all too familiar aroma. I'm glaringly out of place on the side of the road near a thick forest. Bleach. I scanned the grass for something, anything that would, that would prove that I hadn't imagined it all. I walked up the road for a better look. From there I scanned both directions, no skid marks, no nothing. This wasn't a pull the wreck out of the woods operation. This was a, a hardcore cleanup crew. Somebody, somebody had put a hell of a lot of effort into covering it up, but why? Does this street look like it's been cleaned recently? I asked. O'Brien scoffed by the way of an answer. I crossed the opposite side of the road and I knelt down. Pretty sure there's not a wreck over there either, nail polish. Whoever did this had resources that I couldn't barely even fathom. This, this would have taken money, manpower, precision, but even the most thorough cleanup crews would make mistakes when time is a factor. I, I reached into the grass, I picked up a tiny shard of broken safety glass. An old silver pickup truck pulled up behind the deputy cruiser, and again, I reached for the empty spot on my right side like a phantom limb. I kept expecting to find my handgun only to remember that I'm as vulnerable as when that family were arguing over who got to kill me. The man stepped out of the truck and came around to face us with a big, friendly smile. He was late fifties with a dirty white beard and a camo jacket. A tucked in white shirt that showed off a pot belly spilling over the edge of his jeans. Morning, he said to me, basically ignoring O'Brien. It's still morning? I hadn't actually seen a clock since I woke up. There's no way all this could have could have been cleaned up in just a few hours. Hey, said back. He laughed and said, You look like shit. What happened? I cut myself shaving. He finally acknowledged O'Brien with the simplest flash of eye contact before looking back at me and asking, Y'all lose something? But before I could answer, his cell phone started ringing. And he put out a finger and dug it into his pocket. Yeah. His look turned into one of slight confusion before he lowered it. Took a look around, then at the phone, then at O'Brien and me. Then he said, Is one of you Eric Riggins? I looked at O'Brien, who shook her head and laughed softly. <laughs> Don't look at me. Uh, I'm Eric. It's, uh, it's for you. Put the glass shard in my pocket and I walked over to the man extending his phone. The whole situation was too much for my brain to digest. I genuinely had no idea what was going on, who to trust, or even what was real anymore. That's when I first noticed that my tongue was feeling extra fat. A warm sensation was pouring over me. And I could have just been an effect of the blood loss, but somehow this... this felt different. I decided to ignore the feeling for now, and... I reached out for the phone. 
Yeah, this is Eric. Finally! Where the hell have you been all day? Of all the possible voices I expected to hear on the other side of that line, this was not one of them. Roger? Who the hell were you expecting, Santa Claus? How did you find me? I know things, Detective. Time to take a little bit of face, all right? I know the investigation got a little derailed this morning. Somebody's screwing with you, which is a good sign. They're trying to throw you off the scent before you're asking questions, and they, they aren't used to people in this town asking questions. You kicked their hornet's nest, and they're pissed off. I leaned away from O'Brien, and I whispered this duck's part into the phone. Roger. I was attacked. People are dead. Really? You didn't sound all that impressed. Well, we're definitely going to have to talk about that later. For now, though, I found something in Vanessa's file that we need to discuss. You got a gun, right? Uh, yeah, somewhere. Ditch it. Drop it in the bottom of the ocean if you have to. I guarantee by now, they've tied the ballistics in one or two of the open murder cases in town. <sighs> Look, tell, tell me one thing. What the hell's going on? Lose the coffer. I, I don't know who to trust yet. And meet me at the bowling alley tonight at 8. Oh, come alone. Uh, pay attention, because you'll probably need to shake a tail. And, detective? Yeah? Take a shower. With that, we disconnected. I looked at O'Brien, who was leaning against the truck of her car, arms crossed and watching me. Who was that? She asked. I handed the phone back to the man and shrugged at the deputy. It looks like I made a huge mistake. Yeah? She said incredulously. Yeah, I answered. She gave me a ride back to the gas station while I spun a yarn about having a serious case of sleepwalking. I assured her that I had dreamt the whole thing up. And I must have gone off into the woods in my unconscious state, got myself scraped up pretty bad, then I must have wandered back into town confused, and a little worse for the wear. And either she bought my story, or she had her own reasons to accept that there was no reason to press it further. She didn't strike me as an idiot, so I concluded it must have been the latter. She brought me to my car, gave me a straightforward warning, before she took off. I don't know what answers you think you're going to find, but I wouldn't stick around much longer if I were you. We got the guy who killed Vanessa. Take it from me. Closure. It's overrated. To be continued. Hey there, everyone who's listening on YouTube, or those of you who are listening on the podcast. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before you head out for the night, I just wanted to let you know about a couple of things. Without you, the show doesn't take place. So, if you guys would like to support the show, or if you guys would like to get your hands on a couple of cool little things whenever new things come out, check out patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, and any support that you guys show, I really appreciate it. So everyone who's already donated to the Patreon... I really appreciate it. You guys are amazing. I thank you so much for that. If you guys are looking for more Creepypasta Storytime, there's a new video that's uploaded to this channel or uploaded to the podcast every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday now. You can be able to get more from me at facebook.com slash mrcreepypasta or on Twitter at mrcreepypasta and then the number zero. Thanks so much for listening, kids, and for your support. And sweet dreams.